Well, first of all, welcome. And uh, it's good to have you here. I'm, I love coming here to present because uh, I, I just, I, I like, I, I love photography. I love spreading the word about photography. And I really wanted to do something different this time. And I wanted to start with, with something a little bit more basic than, than pro level stuff and talking about advanced modes for shooting sports or portraits or whatever. But just get back to the basics of what is good photography. And I changed my slide deck this morning and I added this slide, which is, what makes a good photo? And I was, I, I was actually in the shower this morning, bad visual. Um, and I was thinking like, what makes a good photo? And we're gonna talk about lighting and focus and different ways to shoot, and different tricks that I use or whatever. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, what really makes a good photo is something that means something to us, right? So I've t I took a photo last night. Uh, I'm staring, staying right in Times Square. So I took a picture of Times Square on, from the 34th floor with my iPhone. Post it to Facebook. And it tells a story. It says where I am, basically where I'm staying, if anybody knows New York City. But it, 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 it tells, I put it on Facebook, and so people know where I am. It's not the best photo I've ever taken, but it tells a story. And so it doesn't matter, this class is not about DSLRs and point and shoots and iPhones or whatever it might be. It's just about good photos. And um, it's funny because I'll go to you know, Yosemite, I'll see people taking a family picture and they'll do it in the worst possible spot. And I, and I cringe and my kids are like, dad, don't go up to them, don't, don't tell them. I'm like, and it just kills me. I'm like, I wanna go, okay, right, everybody move here. But I don't, because uh, I don't wanna, sometimes I do, but I try not to interrupt too much. Just on the walk here, uh, I, I love walking, so I walked here from my hotel. And there was a guy taking a picture on the corner just now, and he had his lens hood reversed on his SLR. And it's like, I so wanted to stop walking, go, uh, turn that around, put it the right way. I didn't. But seriously, this just basic stuff that we can learn to make a better photo. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So it's all about the basics. And these are kind of some of the basics that we're going to cover. Um, not mixing light and shadows is probably the number one thing. And I've got examples as we go through all of these. You know, basic composition, horizons, which I didn't put in here, but I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse than getting a photo from, I won't say who, my brother. Um, and, and he goes, hey, Jeff, look, look at this photo we took on our cruise, and the, the ocean's like this. And it's like, and my wife looks at me and says, don't, don't write back and tell him his horizon's <laughs> crooked. Because again, it's about the photo. And not everybody's going to take perfect photos. And sometimes you don't want your horizon to be straight. But in the times when it would be better that way, OK. But there's, again, depends what you're shooting. Shooting at your subject's level, focusing on the eyes if you're focusing on a face, thinking about your background, thinking about what the subject is of your image. And it's funny, because that one sounds really um, obvious. But a lot of times when people are taking a, a picture of a landscape, and I'll say, what's your subject? And they go, um, the, the whole area. I go, no, no, no. What do you want your viewer to look at? So we're going to talk about that. Shooting off center, rule of thirds or not. Um, getting out of automatic mode. And this is probably the number one thing I like to teach. It amazes me how many people have a DSLR, a good camera, and they keep it in automatic mode. Because automatic mode means now that you're walking around with a really big, really heavy point and shoot camera. So learning how to get out of automatic mode and get into something like aperture priority lets you control your photo and control what you're going to have your viewer look at. So we're going to talk about that. Um, learning, how to, uh, learning how to use your flash. And this is another area where people think of a flash at night. People rarely think about using your flash during the day. And I'll show you some examples of where I use my flash during the day to get a much better image. Um, getting in close, huh, I see this all the time, right? People go to take a picture of their friends, and what do they take? They take from toe to head. And after that, I was shooting at Bar Mitzvah on Saturday, and this family said, can you take our photo? And I said, sure. And she said, I want full length. It was with their camera. I said, sure, no problem. And I backed up and I shot full length. I go, hold on a second. Let me take one more, though, and do it my way. And I shot it much closer, and she looked at me and she said, oh, that's way better. And so people tend to be, get preconditioned to shoot head to toe. That may not be the best shot. And of course, what do we do as photographers? We take lots of photos. I'll take one head to toe, one maybe, maybe portrait, or sorry, landscape this way, maybe one portrait this way, and see which one I like the best. Which is also a good thing for having a large memory cards, is I can shoot as much as I want. So uh, I'm spoiled. Uh, I, I use uh, really large, like 128 gig, 64 gig cards. So I never run out of space. I'll just keep shooting. 
but which actually is something I really didn't put in here, but one of the things you'll see a professional photographer do is we'll shoot hundreds sometimes to get one really great portrait. And so with digital now that it's not film, you guys can do the same thing I'm doing, even with a 16 gig card, shoot a lot. It always kills me when someone sets up their whole family for, for a family picture and then they go click and they walk away. I'm like, uh, you have eight people in that picture. Joey may have been looking over here. Mom may have her eyes closed. Why not shoot five, six, seven, or eight of each of those? Um, having fun and breaking the rules. And this is probably the most important thing about photography. Uh, and it, I love it. It's a passion for me. I mean, I really enjoy doing this. And that comes out in my images. And when people say, well, you know, do you, when you go to New York, what do you bring home? Yeah, I might bring home a Starbucks mug that says New York or something. But I really want to bring home another really cool picture of something I haven't photographed before in New York. So that's what I like to have fun and do. Um, and learn good editing, which I'm not going to go into too much of that because it's, that in itself is a whole other class. Actually, the class I'm doing after this is going to cover um, the 15 features of Photoshop, which I use for 90% of my images. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the good editing piece. So um, before we go any farther, people always ask how to get a hold of me. This is how you get a hold of me. So on Facebook, Jeff Cable Photography. Uh, my blog, how many people here read the blog? Okay, um, just Jeff Cable at blogspot or dot blogspot.com. And uh, I try to blog every week and uh, I try to teach, like here's what I shot today, here's how I shot it, here's the camera settings I used. Um, so I make it uh, where I am in the world, but I also make it about, like I try to give hints of what I was thinking when I shot the particular image. And of course my website. So, first thing, and of course if you talk to almost any photographer, they'll tell you it's all about the light. And a lot of it is all about the light. So I did uh, some videos for Target. And I went out and I had to shoot this model or this friend who was modeling for me in the worst possible light. Let me tell you something, as a photographer, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done is trying to put them in bad situations. It was really hard to shoot this. Here's uh, Claire in a really bad light. You'll see that she was underneath a tree and I had model light. I have mixture of shade, light, everything on her. And it's distracting. Right? So uh, another shot of her in bad light with a bad background. Right? So here I've got her with sunlight, you know, highlighting the wrong part of her face with shadows there. You see a shadow from her hair and a lovely car in the background. And unfortunately, a lot of people when they take photos get that because they don't say, hey, wait, let me move you guys here. So literally moving her about a foot so that the trees were behind her and she was in shade, I shot that. Now, I would still edit out some stuff and clean her up, but I wanted to show you just from a pure picture-taking perspective, by moving someone a couple of inches, you get a totally different image, okay? So next time you go to take a picture of friends or family, and you see that they're in shadow and highlights, move them into all shadow or all sunlight, generally facing away from the sun, I like to, and I'll put a flash on them to light them up. Make sense? All right. Um, this is another shot I did um, in trees where uh, it was all shadowed. I actually love shooting in shadows. And this one here, I added some light by popping a flash um, at Maddie and uh, turned, it, turned the flash down. One of the things, whenever I use a flash outside, I like to turn it down, the power down, to minus one stop, which on, on a Canon flash, all you do is you hit the middle button and you just dial it down minus one and hit the button again. So if you have a flash and you don't know how to control it, you can learn that. You can even do this on point and shoot cameras, although with a small flash on a point and shoot, probably let it go full power, okay? So you can add flash and I'll show you some examples of that. Here's another bad shot. Um, this is water polo. When I was practicing before going to the Olympics in London, I was practicing water polo. And here, you don't have a choice because the sun was in the wrong location where I'm trying to shoot pictures of Tommy over here and he's facing the wrong way. You can see the sun's on the back of his cap. There isn't really a good shot there. Now, yeah, I could go into Photoshop and lighten him and do a bunch of stuff. But again, this is not about professional editing. This is just about taking a good photo. You really can't. It's not good lighting. Now, inverse of that is this photo where I shot it at a swim meet and I had beautiful light coming. It was end of the day. Matter of fact, it was scaring me because 
I was shooting these images, and the, my favorite stroke is butterfly because they come out of the water. So I really wanted this shot. I, don't even, I didn't even know who this girl was, but I really wanted the shot. And the sun was dropping really fast, and so I had that really golden light. It was perfect for this shot. So this is taking advantage of the light that I had versus trying to avoid it. Okay. Now, another thing is getting to their level. And this is something else I see quite a bit. Most of us in this room probably range in height between five and six feet, give or take. And that's where we shoot from. Um, and this is great if you're taking a picture of someone who else is our height, but doesn't really work well if you're shooting pictures of your pet. So here's my dog, Cooper, who got in trouble. <laughs> so um, we left Cooper outside. Cooper really was like, you know what? If they're going to leave me out for this long and not give me a walk, I'm going to wreak havoc. And so he decided to dig a, like a 12-inch hole in our grass and dig his face in there. And that's what we got. And I actually uh, I, I shot some through our, our door. But again, shooting through glass uh, ruined it. So I actually went out there and like, don't get near me, dog, and, <laughs> uh, and shot this. But it was classic. I mean, you couldn't have made up a dog to look funnier than that. But this was shot from my height, because there was no way in heck I was going to get low and have him jump on me and get me all muddy. But this is it's still a good shot. But I'm like actually getting down low. So this is Cooper as a puppy. When I got down almost to grass level, what does it do? Right? It brings you to their level. It, it, it's more intimate when you're shooting at that level, whether it's pets or babies or whatever. So that's him running. Here's him laying on the grass. Uh, playing and again you could tell just from the grass level here I'm almost on the grass sometimes I will even lay down on the grass and shoot but those eyes if I was shooting from uh, six feet high you wouldn't get that right this is him laying on a, on a couch and again I got down to the couch level and shot it so that the pause and everything he becomes that image he is that subject. This is my in-law's dog, same thing, getting real low. This is a, a baby that I shot at the Olympics in Vancouver, the Winter Olympics. And um, you know, again, this is where, as a photographer, one of the things I do quite a bit, and one of the things I like to walk a lot is I like to stretch my legs, because we're doing this all the time, where we get low. And so and I, t I play ice hockey twice a week. I get way more sore shooting than I do playing hockey, if you can believe that. And the reason is we're constantly contorting. We're doing this, or doing this, or we're down here. And um, I like to actually get on the ground and shoot up, or I'll climb stuff and shoot down. Um, I've even uh, shot an event uh, that was uh, an event at an ice rink. So I was on my hockey skates and skating backwards shooting. That was interesting. Um, but shooting and you know, really kind of trying to get low on that too, that was a challenge. But I'm always trying to get to that eye level. I shouldn't say always, most of the time. Unless you're trying to highlight something different than their face. Most of the time for basic photography, if your eyes are not in focus, you don't have a photo. Um, and I get a lot of these two where people say, look at this photo, what do you think? And it's really cute of Johnny or Sally and I go, oh, it's really cute, and it's still cute. But to me, what, if, it's, if the eyes are blurry and, and maybe the, fo the focus is back on the sweater over here or whatever, you know, it's just not a quality photo. Now, it might mean a lot to mom and dad, which is great, still a photo, but it'd be better if you get the eyes in focus. So I like to focus in on the eyes of whether it's an animal or a person. I want to be focusing on that. So if you look at this photo and you look at the eyes, I want those to be tack sharp. And why? Human beings are drawn to eyes. That's where your, your eyes will go to their eyes most of the time. Anybody here, who, how many people here have DSLRs? How many people here still have their focus mode set to where all the lights light up depending on you know, when you hit the button? A lot. Turn that off. Why they do that, I have no idea. Here's the problem with that. If I'm taking the, this photo and I hold the button down on the DSLR, the focal points will go, oh, the, the ladder over there. That's what you want to focus, right? Or, or maybe this. No, I want to control the camera and tell it where I want to focus. So I'll put the center point on. Now, you'll notice that the center point would put me maybe on her nose. So what I'll do is I will move the camera a little bit, focus halfway down, focus on the eye, 
shift back a little bit, and then press the rest of the way down. That's my photo. And uh, why they keep the spectrum all lit up is crazy. So read your manual on how to turn that off. And you'll get way better pictures just in itself. And here's the way you want to test this. And this is the way I teach when I teach back home. I tell people, do this to me. And I have them point their finger at me. And I stand on the other side. And I shoot a picture. And I focus on their eye. And I try to shoot it at a really wide aperture. So I'll shoot it like f2.8. And the tip of their finger will be completely blurred. And their eyes are in focus. And then I focus on the tip of their finger, and that's perfectly in focus, and now your face is totally out of focus. What am I saying there? What I'm saying t is, when I turn around the camera and I show them those two photos, I'm determining where you as the viewer are going to look. I'm saying, I want you to look at, this guy's mad at me, so I want you to focus on the tip of the finger, like, Arr. or I want you to look at their face. But I'm determining that. If you have that spectrum turned on, the camera's not going to know what you, and it's going to start guessing. You don't want to guess, because you want to determine that focal point. So here, I'm locked in on the eyes. Same thing, this was uh, the gymnastic trials before the uh, Summer Olympics in London. Uh, and that's uh, Gabby doing her famous uh, balance beam routine. And look at the eyes. They're tack sharp, right in focus. And again, it's a cool photo, but if her face wasn't in focus, uh, it kind of wouldn't be a shot. I would have deleted it. OK? But there are exceptions. I know I didn't misspell that. <clears throat> there are times when you don't want to show the face. There's cool colors back here. Or maybe it's the cute little tail of the dog. right? So there are times when I'm focusing on something other than the eyes, <clears throat> depending on the story I'm trying to tell. OK? So um, I shot a uh, bat mitzvah about a year ago. And my favorite shot from that bat mitzvah was mom and her daughter in the front row leaning against each other in a moment. And all you see, they're very similar hairdos. And all you see is the two of them <clears throat> together. That told the story to me as much as any photo I took that day because there was something unspoken about that one moment that worked. So I wasn't trying to say, oh, well, I can't get their eyes. I'm not going to take the photo. right? So uh, there are times when you do break those rules. And here's the thing about photography. Um, it's subjective. I mean, some people look at my stuff and go, it's junk. And you know what? They have every right to do that. Um, I shoot because I love shooting. I'm, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I, I mean, I like to get stuff for me. But um, you know. It, the great thing about photography is you can break the rules. Uh, I'll teach you one thing. You can go out and do something completely different. My daughter, who's 16, almost 16 now, she has a very different perspective than I do. We can go to the exact same place to shoot, same thing with my wife, and I'll look at their images and go, oh, that's incredible. I totally missed that. And they see things differently. And you know what? It's not wrong or right. It's just what they saw. So don't feel like you have to have the eyes or nothing. It's just these are just good rules of thumb to kind of work from. Distractions. Um, and I see this a lot with people when uh, you're shooting and they don't want to move people. I don't know why people do that, but as a photographer, we get very used to saying to someone, oh, wait, let's, let's shift you over here. But um, people don't want to do that because I think when people say, here, take my photo, they just go, oh, OK. okay. Um, I had someone at Times Square last night at midnight. I go, can you take our photo? And I'm like, sure. And of course, those poor people, because I was like, all right, move here, do this. And they're like, really? I go, I'm a, I'm a photographer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and then it all made sense. But the one thing I really hate is when you say to someone, I want to take your photo, and they do this. I don't know why, but OK. <laughs> why do people always back up to walls and hedges? They just do. So what do you get if you use a flash? And there's right here, you get a harsh flash off the wall. So I always say, come toward me, come toward me, keep going, keep going, good. Or if they're not centered up to what I want them, I'll say, everybody, baby steps, that way, stop, good. And I'll direct them. Okay. In the case of backgrounds, you really want to avoid stuff like this. Um, cute picture of a little kid, nice background, garbage cans. And this is, the one, this is one of those shots I did uh, when I was working on the target stuff on what not to shoot. And it pained me even to take the photo. But you know what? Of all the photos that you see that are out there, they're on Facebook and 
wherever else, there's lots of them that have really horrible backgrounds. And uh, people just don't think about it. And the other thing is, I will say, don't, uh, don't expect all of your friends to be honest with you or that they know any better. So when people all write to you and say, that's an amazing photo, you know, there aren't that many people who are going to write back to you and say, you know what? Your background sucked. <laughs> right? So it's up to you to kind of like try to learn this stuff and make your photos better. Um, here's another one. I actually took this of my son uh, in Halloween. This was 10 years ago or so um, in front of my truck. And I, you know, really, I couldn't have said to him, hey, you know, you're Merlin. Let's move you somewhere better. No, I took it right there. Ugh. Uh, love this shot. This is another bad shot of what not to do with lighting, but also a beautiful fire hydrant right behind her. Now, could I clone that out in Photoshop? Sure. I could also either have moved a couple inches that way or had her move a couple inches this way. And guess what? She would have blocked it. Now, you want to be careful because I also see a pole there. So one of the things you also want to avoid is uh, tree trunks growing out of people's heads, which I see all the time. I even do it. Sometimes you don't have a choice. If you're doing a family portrait and they're in front of trees, you may end up with a tree coming out of someone's head, in which case I'll try to Photoshop it out. Um, or minimize it, darken it, whatever. But here, uh, I would probably either get rid of it, but of course the lighting is so horrible, I'd say this is not even a place to take a photo. This is in trees. Um, this is the general manager of the San Jose Sharks and his family for their Christmas picture this year. And here I had nice shade. I used the trees to my advantage. There aren't really any trees coming out of people's heads per se that looked like they were perfectly in focus. I had nice even light because I was throwing a little bit of flash on them and it was sharp. This one here in the background, this is actually, this is weird because I live in the middle of uh, uh, the San Jose area uh, in, in California and we never get ducks or any wildlife other than people walking their dogs in front of our house. And one day my neighbor came over and said, there's a family of ducks in the front yard. And I said, what? So I went out there and sure enough, that's right in our front yard. And what you don't see is the street and cars. And the reason is I got really low to avoid the ugly background. I shot it at f 2.8. So I'd blur the background so that it would draw your attention right to the mallard and nothing else. So if in doubt, if you have a horrible background, try to get low, try to get high, try to do something different to avoid it. Now there's times when you want to use a background. Uh, this one here was taken in Sydney. Um, the, believe it or not, the Sydney Zoo has this real estate uh, of a view. It's amazing. So I don't want to avoid that. I want to take advantage of that. So what I did was I waited for, I don't know, probably 45 minutes for, for some uh, drafts to come in so that they'd create a frame for me with the Opera House. Now, could I have shot this at 2.8 so you'd never see the background? or shot from a different position? Sure, I don't want to. So I'm thinking about my background as I'm shooting. Do I want to use it or do I not? So let's say I'm shooting an event for someone. Let's say it's a wedding reception. And I say, where's your reception? And they say, oh, it's going to be in this particular hall. And it's fairly low budget. So it's going to be in a, ba uh, a basketball uh, arena at a high school. Ah. Do I want to show the basketball rims and the bleachers and the, no. So what do I do? I shoot everything at an aperture that tries to defocus everything but the bride and groom or the people there. The inverse of that is if I'm in some really amazing location and they have really cool stuff on the walls and great lighting and they've paid for, you know, decorations and stuff, then I want to utilize that, then I'll shoot differently to include that background. Is all this making sense so far? Good? All right. All right. Here's another example. Uh, this was at the uh, uh, Vancouver Olympics. When I was shooting, the, the Olympics are a weird place because you're, in this case, for certain venues, you're fixed to a position. So when I walked into figure skating, I turned in my, my, uh, my photo sleeve for another photo sleeve, and they said, you are position 28, which is a 18-inch little square, and guess what the, where you're living for the next six hours? You're at position 28. So what I'm doing is, I, okay, I'm here. No choice. I'm looking around. And I think, oh, that's cool. I've got the Vancouver 2010 with two Olympics uh, uh, emblems there. It'd be really great to get a, a skater right there and get a shot because it tells a story where I am. Right now, do I want the Vancouver 2010 to be perfectly in focus? No, because I would rather have the skater be my focus. That is my subject, but there's enough of a hint of it to let you know where I am. I'm just not so out of focus. 
as to be invisible and not so sharp as to be distracting. All right. Um, same thing here. This is uh, in, in uh, the recent Summer Olympics in London. This is one of the uh, fences from Team USA, as you can tell by the helmet. And I, I shot plenty of shots where I focused just on them. And then I moved and thought, you know, be a cool shot is to get the time and scoreboard as well as the flags. So all I did is I just moved my position. And again, in this venue, you can move to many different little benches anywhere along the way and shoot. So I moved to try to utilize the colors and something interesting in the photo to make it a little bit more dynamic. And I also moved the, moved the frame so that the fencer was off center. Because what that does is it actually creates and draws your eye from one side of the frame to the other, which is why we do that. Same thing with this shot. This shot here is totally different. Here I use the background. Here I avoided the background. Same venue, probably within the same half hour time frame of shooting. And here I wanted to, to blow out. This is the audience in the background. So the audience, if they've been perfectly in focus, right? Like a typical point and shoot camera, the goal is what? Everything in focus. But then you don't have a separation, which is why we use expensive lenses. Now, let me clarify for those people who have DSLRs and don't want to spend you know, two, three grand on a lens, you can get a lens like the Canon uh, or Nikon make the um, 50 millimeter 1.4 lens for like 350 bucks, or 50 millimeter 1.8 for even less than that, like 150, something like that. Those lenses are amazing. So it's the 50 1.4 or 50 1.8, very inexpensive and amazing lenses for portraits and separation. Now, could I shoot this shot with a 50 millimeter? No, because I'm not going to get up on stage while they're fencing and go, hold that for a second and, and shoot it. So I'm using a zoom. But the idea is still the same if you're doing portraits. They're really, really cool lenses and inexpensive for doing this type of shot and creating separation or depth of field. This one here, again from London, utilizing the background. This is probably one of the coolest venues I'd ever photographed at the Olympics. Um, how often do you get you know, Big Ben, the London Eye, and all the great architecture in a venue? Not very often. So here, I climbed up into the audience and shot a wide shot so I could show everything. And again, I don't want to hide the fact of where we are, so I want to shoot this at like F11 or F16 to get everything in focus. And so one of the things is, as, as a photographer myself is I'm keeping all this in mind. And for those people who are new at photography, it's like speaking a foreign language. You have to practice it and keep doing it. But really, if you just walk away with, when I go to, and I, and I still go to classes, when I go to class, I hope to bring home one or two new tips that I can you know, utilize. And I read magazines, and I see things that people are doing, like, oh, I never thought about that. And so I'll go try it. So you want to keep this in mind as you're going. Like use, as Ansel Adams said, the most important feature of the camera is with 12 inches behind it, <laughs> right? And one of the reasons I like to blog when I blog stuff, like if I go shoot a bar mitzvah or something, I'll blog about how I shot it because I want the family to know that I'm not just some guy walking around hitting a button. I'm actually thinking about what I'm shooting and I'm changing settings and doing something different, you know, to make it more interesting. We're not just doing this. Which is interesting, because remember I talked about how I get physically tired when I shoot? I do get mentally tired as well. Uh, it's a really interesting thing when you're shooting, because uh, when you're getting paid by a client to shoot, you have to be on your A game. Well, sometimes that A game could be 12 hours. And let me tell you something. At the end of the day, my wife laughs at me on Sundays when I shoot all day Saturday, because I'm like a jellyfish, like Because uh, uh, I'm spent physically and emotionally. Because um, we're always thinking. Here's a shot where, again, I wanted to use the background because look what it says, the US Olympic Trials. Again, a little bit out of focus because I want the focus to be on the gymnast, but enough that you see where I am and, and where it's taken. So utilizing that background. This is one I took, um, uh, this is a friend of ours. She wanted her senior pictures taken. And um, it's funny because this is a park by my house. I'd never seen these flowers bloom before like this. So we're looking for different locations to shoot. And again, I'm looking for areas that have good light, right? Give me some with all shade or all sun, but not a mixture of it. And we saw these flowers. Can you climb in there without trampling them? Can you get in there and just kind of sit like this? And so again, I got really low so that I can get the right, fill the frame with flowers in her. And you'll see that these are out of focus 
Those are out of focus. Why? Because I'm focused just on our eyes. And that's my subject. That's what I wanted. But I'm filling the frame using this background and foreground in this case. It'd be a shame to hide it. Here's one on my last trip here. Uh, you don't want to hide it, right? You want everything in focus here because the background, the foreground, the subject, it all wants to be in focus. And we had great clouds. Definitely helped. It's funny, actually, when I shoot portraits, people say, oh, darn, it's cloudy. <laughs> and I go, oh, no, 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 we, we dream for this. <laughs> like when I shoot uh, an event, and I know I'm doing uh, family pictures outside before a wedding or a bar mitzvah or something, I seriously, I wake up in the morning and my wife goes, you're good. And I look out and it's all overcast. I'm like, yes. I need to move to like Seattle or something. <laughs> um, but you know, bald skies create harsh lighting and they're boring. Uh, I was teaching in, uh, a friend in San Francisco, which will be on the blog next week. And we were shooting uh, by the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And it was just bald skies, boring. It just, it's too bad. This is great. So we want to utilize it. Having a subject as, as, as a focal point, and this is one of those areas where, as I mentioned before, people take this for granted. Uh, it's very easy for shooting a portrait because you know who the subject is, or I hope you do. But I, I photographed a, um, a creek one time years ago with Moose Peterson, and I photographed this creek, and Moose said to me, this is you know, eight years ago, what's your subject? I go, the creek. He goes, no, it's not. I go, yeah, it is. He goes, no, it's not. He was right. It wasn't. It was the fall leaves that had fallen on a rock. And then the water was coming around. It was cool. But the subject really was the leaves, the color of the leaves. And I was still learning at the time. You know, so I didn't know what the subject was. But you want to know that because that's going to be the highlight of your photo, hopefully. So here, this is uh, Dario Franchitti uh, on Team Target before a race. I loved it because I had a reflection of the car in his glasses. Uh, I framed it. He is my subject. It's quite obvious because uh, he's right there. What's funny about the shot is he looks really intense, right? Because it's right before the race started. He was tying his shoe on his tire. <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> but it works. Here is camping. So as you, if you can't tell already, I'm really type A and hyper. So I don't sit still very well. So when we go to the beach, like my wife, my daughter can hang out and lay there. I'm like, okay, long lens, surfers, like it just keeps going. So we're camping and I can't just sit there for hours on end or read. So I get my camera out and I just thought, okay, I'll start shooting macro shots. <clears throat> oh, another tip that I didn't put in here, self-assignments. Have you ever done that? Yeah. It's fun. I did it one time here in New York City. I've shot Times Square so many times, it's ridiculous. So I came here and I brought a fisheye lens and my assignment to myself was to shoot New York City through a fisheye the entire time. Kind of fun. So in this case it was, I'm gonna shoot with macros all day long. And so what is my subject? My subject is an ant. Still kind of cool though. And what I like about macro is it brings things to view that the average person doesn't see. So as a photographer, what, what, why do I have the passion for it? Because I bring things to people that they don't see. So fisheye, no one sees in a fisheye, right? So when you shoot in a fisheye, it's more intriguing to people. When you bring things like this into frame, people are like, really, you saw that? I didn't see that. Well, of course not, but are there millions of ants all over your campsite? Of course, right? So it's kind of fun for the kids around us to go, that's cool. Here, want a camera? Let's go shoot. Um, this one here, <laughs> this was taken in uh, Santiago in Chile, and it was, this tells a story because I shot it so that he was in focus, or she, or whatever, the bird's in focus, and all the fishermen are kind of in, soft in the background, but this tells a story, because this says, hey, this, this uh, bird is waiting for some spare fish parts, right? This is actually using a Photoshop effect. Um, but uh, shooting it with 49er game and just kind of adding some different effect to it to kind of make it more dramatic and interesting. So shooting off center. Almost every new photographer, or what we'll just call a consumer who takes pictures, centers. If you look at most people who take pictures with a phone, centered, everything's centered. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Not really. But it can be more interesting if you don't center. And so again, as a photographer, try it both ways. Center or don't. So here's my daughter in Chicago. 
This is at, uh, what's the, Millennium Park. And it was all roped off by the police, but I thought this is just too good of a shot. So we kind of climbed under the rope and, and shot it. And the police came and said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, but look at the picture. The guy goes, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, he was really nice. He's like, yeah, we knew we weren't like vandalizing the place. So we, we just left and we didn't harm anything, but it was pretty funny. Now, could I have shot this picture dead center? Sure. Totally. Yeah, it's more interesting this way with all the red chairs all around. It shows the vastness. It does. Right. It's just more, you know, and, and the other thing is it, the eye gets drawn to my daughter. And the funny thing was I really, she sat there like kind of just sitting there and I'm like, oh, Al. I go, you got to be more excited than that. And she wouldn't, and I go, this is when she was younger. I go, Hannah Montana's on stage. And then that's when she went like that. And I, fr I grabbed the frame, but I have like 20 different frames of her, but all of them were with her off centered. So what did I do here? I focused on her eyes over here and then just shifted the camera so she's off focus, or sorry, off center and shot it. Same thing here uh, at the Vancouver Olympics. Yep, I have, I actually do have this shot with the bobsled dead center, but two things. One, it was covering the logo, the Olympic rings. And the other thing was, it doesn't tell the story. This tells me a story. This guy is flying this way, All right? So using, that image to tell the story is what it's about. And again, like I said, it doesn't have to be a professional image. It could just be the photo like I took last night from my iPhone. Have it tell a story, try to do as best you can. This shot from London Olympics, this is uh, before the Olympic Games started. I, I, I took my wife, we went on vacation to Paris and London, and then I kicked her out the day before opening ceremonies because I knew I'd never see her. But we were out uh, being tourists. And the funny thing was, I told her, with my Olympic credentials, we're gonna get to places that no one else can go. So we went to Buckingham Palace to shoot this, and the guy goes, oh, credentials? Get out of here. I go, why? He goes, oh, because you're a professional. You can't shoot this stuff. And I, but you know, I'm surrounded by 20,000 people with SLR cameras. So he, he looked at me and goes, no credentials. Uh, oh, so I went back, took my credentials off, and then I could shoot how I wanted. <laughs> go figure it. Sometimes it worked against me. Um, so again, could I center it? Sure, I could center it. But I actually liked the lines of the building taking me over to the bobby. Did I shoot it center too? I did. Just to make sure that I didn't like this better or see which one I liked. Um, this one here, Eiffel Tower, this is again before the Olympics. And um, this is a shot I knew I wanted. I hadn't been to Paris in a long time and I knew I wanted this shot. So we sat out there, waited for the sky to go dark. Another tip for those people, favorite time to shoot? After sunset, because you get the deep blue sky. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been to beautiful places in the world. The sun goes down, everybody leaves. That's when I get there. Because that's about 10 to 15 minutes after the sun goes away, depending on where you live and what time of year it is, is when you get this deep blue sky, which you may not even see it, the camera will pick it up. And it's beautiful. If this was a black sky, if it was at you know, 10 o'clock at night or midnight, it would not look good. You'd have no separation between all this and the sky, and it would just eh, it'd be OK, but it wouldn't be great which really sucks because that means you have about 20 minute window during the day to get a really great night shot. So my deal with my wife was when we went to Europe, she says, you're not gonna shoot the whole time, are you? Because she knows me. And I said, well, tell you what, I'll shoot, but I'm not gonna be actively looking for a great shot, except give me every night between sunset and half an hour after sunset. That was our deal. You had a question. What uh, shot the speed? What shutter speed do I use? Well, it's interesting. Um, I typically will look at the lights and how much I want. So the question is, what shutter speed? And, and I'm determining how much of a uh, movement I want. If I have a really windy night, and my tripod's a good tripod, but it still might shake a little bit, I'll probably go to a, a pretty quick shutter speed. Uh, I might even put the ISO up higher to get a quicker shutter speed. But typically for night shots, as long as it's fairly calm, I don't really uh, care. I might be going more on aperture, like do I want everything in focus or just the Eiffel Tower in focus? Um, or um, I may look at light trails. So here's a shot centered, the same shot moving off center, I thought was more interesting. Mm -hmm. Now does it show the whole Eiffel Tower? No. Is there anybody that would say, well that's not the Eiffel Tower because there's no top to it. <laughs> Here. I was working exactly what you were saying. I was looking at the shutter speed because I wanted the motion of the, the trails of the cars to create lines for me, to make it more dramatic. Because frankly, um, if I didn't shoot it that way, 
it would be a little bit more bald at the bottom. I wanted nothing wrong bald, but I wanted it to be a little bit more colorful and exciting down there. The other thing is if you shoot at an aperture, a, an aperture of like F16 or F22, you get the starburst off the lights. So again, going back to what I said earlier, I'm thinking, oh, this poor little head, because I'm thinking all this stuff as I'm shooting. Oh wait, I want starburst, or I want trails of lights, or I want this, I want both things in focus. And I'll be honest with you, part of me thought, I don't know if this is gonna be a good shot because <clears throat> I really wanted to have the entire Eiffel Tower. Then when I looked at the back of the camera, I thought, oh wait, this really works. So I take risks and try things different. Yeah. So this one, are you shooting on aperture or are you shooting on <clears throat> I shoot, yeah, thank you. Question is, it was, was the shot in aperture priority? I almost always shoot in aperture priority. I mean, there are times I'll go to manual, like at the Olympics, when I know what I've got for lighting and all that. But I, I actually prefer aperture priority. And the reason I do is because aperture priority lets me determine my depth of field. The camera will figure out the, expo the shutter speed for me. And I'll work with the ISO because I'm kind of watching my shutter speed. So if I'm hand holding this, which I would never do at night, but if I were, I know that I need a shutter speed to be fairly fast, I may have to turn up my ISO. If I'm on a tripod, I'll keep it low and just let it be a longer shutter speed. So I'm thinking about this as I shoot. And I'll show you an example of how, how to set this in a minute. This is another shot off-centered, um, just a flower. This is in uh, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Um, I shot it off-centered because I thought it'd be more interesting. This shot, next shot, makes me laugh. Um, everybody says it looks like the Windows screen that comes with Microsoft Windows. Um, this shot, uh, I've had a lot of people comment on this shot when I put it on the blog. This was just taken off of Highway 280 by my house. And I literally drove by, I have driven by this probably a thousand times. And most people I've showed this to who live in our area have no idea where this is taken. Why? Because they don't see it. So when people say, why do I love photography? And people sometimes, I will say, people who watch the video of me on the b &H YouTube channel sometimes think, oh, this guy's full of himself. Trust me, I'm not full of myself. I, I, I'm still learning too. I love what I do. So I hope that doesn't get misconstrued. But it opened up my eyes. I see things that I never saw before. You know, whether it's the ant on the flower or this, I drive by and I'll see amazing sunlight at the end of the day on a tree. And I'm like, oh my god, I got to stop and shoot that. And it drives my family crazy. Like, you're not really going to spend 45 minutes here, are you? <laughs> yeah, I am. And so I'll shoot it. But this is just off a freeway. I pulled over. I always wanted to get the shot because I always saw the lines of the hills and that one tree. Now, granted, there's other trees over on the side. I chose not to show them. So I like the loneliness of this one there. But I just pulled over. I happened to be driving. I had a long lens with me that day that it was nice and green. And I shot it just off a freeway. So do you have to go to like Istanbul to get a great shot? No. All right, so the question came up about aperture priority. Um, what I teach people is, before starting to get into manual mode and all that, try aperture priority. So get out of automatic mode and try the AV, or aperture priority mode. Different companies call it different things. And what this does, as I mentioned, is it gives you the control of the camera back to you, to that brain to determine what you want in that picture, OK? So um, in this example, if you're at f16, where we had those little, the, the lights coming, the, the starburst coming off the lights, but uh, it's going to create a slower shutter speed, and everything will be in focus. Something like f2 or f2.8, you're going to have almost very little in focus, but very fast shutter speed, easier to shoot at night or in uh, a dark event. You want to shoot with a, an aperture that lets you do that will shoot wide open. If you're shooting with a lens that lets you uh, open up to like f2 or f1.4 or f1.2, it's amazing. Your depth of field is like this. If I'm shooting a picture of you, I'll t your glasses will be in focus. By the time it even goes to your eyes, it'll be out of focus, which is a really cool effect, but you better not be off. So um, different lenses will let you, you know, shoot in different apertures. So people always ask me, well, why is the 70 to 200 lens $2,500 when I could buy a 28 to 300 consumer grade lens for 600 bucks? Well, the reason is that big 70 to 200 lets me shoot at 2.8 all the way through from 70 millimeters to 200 millimeters at 2.8. So I can get great depth of field like that, the fencing shot. 
The consumer grade lens have what's called variable aperture. The more I zoom in, the aperture starts going away from me. So I can't shoot at 2.8 or 3.5 or 4.0. I'm now at 6.3. I, create, I can't get the separation. That's why you don't see people on the, on the sides of uh, football fields shooting with consumer grade lens because I need the separation of the quarterback with the 30,000 fans that are on that side of the field. So try shooting aperture priority. And let me tell you something. You don't need to be shooting with models. Get a cantaloupe, put it on your kitchen counter, put your aperture at the lowest number you can, f4, shoot a picture of the cantaloupe with your background all blurred out, and then put it to f16 and shoot the picture again, and you'll see everything in focus. That's all you have to do. And that's how you learn, OK? So in this case, this is um, a woman, a model that we had in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia. And um, the trees behind her were out of focus. And, I mean, actually, needed to be out of focus because it weren't that interesting. So again, I focused on the eyes. I shot it at f2.8. And you could tell that because if this is out of focus, and the back of the train right behind her is out of focus, and I have a very narrow depth of field there, just at her eyes, and actually just at her front eye, is perfectly in focus. This is my wife in Paris at Versailles. And again, it's the photographer part of me. When I see a whole row of trees, I just can't help it. So I'm like, all right, honey, go back. Nope, two more trees. Nope, one more tree. Stop. OK, peek out. Like, you know. Um, but we are having fun. Uh, but again, you can see the depth of field. Again, I'm drawing the tension where I want you. One of my favorite shots of a kid, um, this was uh, uh, one of our best friend's nieces. And um, this was in a regular kitchen. And uh, I shot this at 2.8 for sure with a 70 to 200. And again, focus on the eye. The eye is tack sharp. She actually did that with her hat. I didn't have to coach her. It was very nice of her to do that. But back here is a kitchen counter. If I shot this in a, in a program or automatic mode, we would have child and kitchen counter in the picture. Would not be a good thing. OK? Question? Yeah, you came in a little bit late. Yeah, one of the subjects is, one of the, que the questions is, do you always fo focus on the eyes? And we talk about this. Yes, most of the time, unless they have a better attribute. <laughs> now, don't take that wrong. I'm like, if someone's got a great mustache, or if, it's, or if it's a bear and he's got like a great, you know, and his teeth are, whatever. I mean, yeah. Well, here's a good example. Where did I focus here? Is it on the eyes of the defender? No. It's the ball and the player. It's actually the American flag. So I was shooting, uh, so I shot for Team USA in, at the London Olympics for USA water polo. And this one here, the reason I shot this, I could easily have focused on the, on the goaltender for Hungary. But I didn't want to do that because that's not who I'm shooting for. I do have tons of those shots too. But I'm trying to focus on, on uh, Acevedo, one of the players for Team USA, because I've got his number, I got his, the flag, I got the ball, I got the rings in focus and I got good motion in the water, that is my subject. That is not my subject, right? So I'm determining that by my focal point and by the aperture. Again, if everything's in focus, your eye is looking and going, uh, where do I look now? Uh, uh, there or there? Well, I'm telling you by controlling my camera where I want you to look. So you shot this in AV mode also? Yep, this is shot in AV mode, okay. aperture priority mode, yep. What shutter speed is on? Fast. <laughs> this was, um, I, I shot, most of the water polo I shot at 1,250th of a second. So if you're shooting sports, you want to try to shoot, if it's a fast sport, if you're shooting curling, you can shoot it really slow. If you're shooting a sport like water polo, football, baseball, uh, soccer, whatever it might be, hockey, you want it to be minimum 500th of a second. You'd like to be at 1,000th of a second. Now, if you're outdoors during the day, no problem. Now, if you're doing ice hockey, mm -hmm. and you're inside, and you're in some of the places where I play, the lighting's not that great, then it helps out for some of the newer cameras where you can crank your ISO way up to 3200 or 6400 and shoot. And then you'll get your shutter speed. You also have to have a lens that lets a lot of light in. Now we're just shooting with the more expensive lenses because they let in more light. So you can shoot at f2.8 all the way through. OK, someone else had a question back here. No, that was the question. Got it? Yeah, I'll crank up ISO. I try not to go above 3,200, but I'll tell you what. I shot uh, uh, um, the bar mitzvah I did on Saturday. There was a, 
um, a moment where the kid was watching his own montage of his life as he's growing up, and he's with all his friends, and the only ambient light in the room was from the projector and the screen. I love that. I don't want to add flash to that because it's such a cool moment. So I put on my uh, Sigma 85 1.4 lens. I opened it up to one f1.4, and I put the ISO, I think I put the ISO at 10,000. This is on a 1DX, that's cheating. But you can, you know, but I shot it. Here's the thing, is it a little bit grainy? Yep. Is it a great shot? Yeah. Because it is only using the light from the projector in his eyes in that expression. Some of them don't come out because the depth of field is really tight. I gotta shoot a lot of them. And I'm also at a pretty slow shutter speed, so I'm holding tight. But if I can get the one, which I got, I'm really happy. So here's the exact opposite. Here I focused on the goaltender. Why? Because it's Team USA. So uh, I'm focusing on her, and everything else is irrelevant. And again, does it tell a story? Yeah, it tells a story because you can tell where her hand is that she's going to block that shot. I think she's the MVP of the Olympics uh, for, the, for the USA, or for uh, water polo, women's water polo. And they won gold. It was really cool. But uh, she played amazing. Uh, and it tells a story. Look, I mean, they come out. Like, they're not standing on the ground, right? They're able to kick themselves up so high to get these things and block it. It's amazing. But I, I pre-focused on the goaltender. So I'm watching the shot clock. And as it goes six, five, four, I know that the people on the team, they're going to shoot because that's what they do. So I'm watching the shot clock. I pre-focus on the, the goaltender, and I just wait. And then just go brrr, and I fire off. And I'm shooting at you know, 12 frames a second, which is how I get the ball right where I want it. It's called spray and pray. <laughs> we just shoot like, don't do portraits that way. You'll freak people out. Um, the kids I shot for Saturday for his bar mitzvah, I, I was using the 1DX and he goes, that's a big camera. I said, oh, this thing shoots like, you know, 14 frames a second or it was. And he goes, show me. I go, okay, here we go. So I go, stand there. And I went, Brrr, and the guy's like, ah. <laughs> It was pretty funny. And the problem with that is then when I go home and I'm downloading all these frames of this kid, I had to delete. So again, talking about aperture priority and determining my focal point, you'll see the focal point is about right dead center on this frame. This is gone, that's gone. This is just in front of an office building in Toronto. So like I told you, I love to come home with a photo. Uh, whenever I have free time, uh, like uh, uh, tomorrow I get free time here, I'll be walking around, I'll probably go to Central Park and just go shoot. For me, nothing more, maybe for the blog. But what's that? I know. Yeah. No thanks. I'm a California boy. I don't. I don't do snow. I got this big coat. I'm like freezing, and you guys are all like, "It's 40. This is great." I'm like, I, um, but I do. I've got. I've got stuff to keep me nice and warm because I do. Lo I love night shooting, so I'll be out night shooting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love it. And this is just like I said. It's just an office building. Uh, but again, why did I shoot it this way? Because I shot it at the angle and the aperture because I don't want to see the office building in the background and I wanted to make it more interesting by not having everything perfectly in focus. Because then it looks like a, what my daughter calls a pass shot, a point and shoot shot where everything's in focus. How many people here know about the triangle? Anybody here not know about the triangle? Okay, if you have a camera that lets you control things, like an SLR camera does. Some point shoots do as well. Mm -hmm. These are the three things that matter in photography. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. And if you adjust one, it's going to change the others. Okay? Or if you adjust two, it'll always change one. So if I'm in a really dark room, like if I want to take a portrait of you in this dark room right now, I would turn up my ISO and I make my aperture as wide as possible. So I have a lens with me right now, it's an f4, 24 to 105 Canon lens. So I'll be at f4, in this light I'll probably be at ISO 6400 to get a shot of you. Then my shutter speed will be x, and the camera will figure out for me. Or I can go into shutter priority and say, I'll set the shutter speed, so for sports, I'd like it to be a thousandth of a second at f4, and I could let the camera figure out what ISO I need to be at. Or I can do set my I, I can uh, set my ISO and one of these, and, and everything is a balance. These two always work together. If you change your aperture, it changes your shutter speed. So if you want everything, if you're in Yosemite and I want a photo of you and the flowers in front of me and half dome in the background, 
I probably want to shoot at F-16 or F-22 to get everything in focus. But guess what? We're outside, we have tons of light. I can do that, handheld. If I want everything in focus and I'm inside in a room like this, there's no way, unless you're gonna shoot at ISO 100,000 or something crazy like that, because my shutter speed's gonna to drop to the point where it could be four seconds, which no one can handle four seconds. I love the people, by the way, that take their mobile phones with a flash on and take a picture of downtown San Francisco from the peak as if their little flash on the camera is gonna light up the entire city and they're hand holding it. it won't reach. Yeah, I won't reach. <laughs> and, and they think it does, and, and it just makes me laugh. But you know, hand holding for two seconds will never work. Remember, when I take a night shot, like the ones you saw at Paris, those are on a tripod. I use either timer mode or a release trigger, and I don't even touch my camera because even the motion of me hitting the button can create a little bit of shake and ruin the image. So thinking that you're going to hand hold that shot, not a chance. So these all work together, and there's a website I want you to write down. It's camerasim.com, and I think you just go to that. I, I think you can get to the camera simulator from that. This is a cool site. I don't even know who started it, but it's amazing. It lets you adjust the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture independently, and it'll show you what your image will look like. Like, will the slide be in focus behind her or not? Or uh, will the pinwheel be spinning and show motion or not? It's really cool. So if you haven't seen this, go to it. I'll give you a second to write that down. I should link to that for my blog. I'll have to do that. You guys got that? OK. It's really fun, because you, know, you can do like F16, ISO 100, and the pinwheel will show complete motion, because now you have a really slow shutter speed. OK? All right. When to flash? Like I said, a lot of people assume that flash is only for nighttime. Not the case. Um, when to flash? Not that kind of flash. <laughs> it's New York. Flashing outdoors. Um, so when I, this is at a zoo, uh, and I'm taking a picture, and you can see all these dark shadows, and you can't really tell. This is the same area shot with a flash turned on to open up the shadows. Um, same thing, here's a little boy at the park. Not a bad photo. It's OK. Turn on a flash, and you get that. But most people don't think about using a flash during the day. Look at the difference between opening up the, and how much more you see of him. I might argue that there's a little too much flash on him on that one. But I just wanted to show you the difference. The question was back here. Yeah, when you're flashing, flashing on the object or flashing at an angle? That's a great question. When I use a flash, Indoors, I never, ever, ever, or should never say never, almost never will point a flash directly at someone. If you want to make someone look horrible, it's a great thing to do. If you really don't like someone, take their picture with a flash turned right toward them, full power, <clears throat> and uh, put it on the magazine cover as pasty white magazine or something. It's horrible. Um, so when I shoot indoors, I either use a diffuser on my flash, or I'll bounce a flash. Like in this room, if I have white walls or close to white walls, I'll bounce off a wall and take a photo so that I'm half light on people, or come off a ceiling. Um, in this case, outdoors, I actually do point the flash undiffused right at someone. But I generally, like I said, I generally turn down the power of the flash because I find that they tend to overcompensate too much. So I like to do it at about minus one or minus two stops. And we'll get some more questions here in a little bit. <clears throat> Um, so there's your before and after. This is uh, another what not to do photo. Uh, this is um, Claire. Uh, and and why, is it, why is it so dark? Can we hear no? Because the light that's coming off her hair, the hair light from the sun that's behind her, I purposely placed her by this tree because the sun was coming in behind her. So it's great hair light. It's pretty. But we lose her. And this is what happens when people try to take a family picture on the beach. A friend of mine just sent me a picture from Hawaii, and I won't name names because I'll get in trouble again, just three days ago. And it's a great picture on the, uh, it's actually a horrible picture. <laughs> it's a great beach. It's her and her husband in Maui right now, and it's like silhouette. And I look at my wife, we're on our iPads, <laughs> look. She says, I know, don't say anything. So, but if they just turn on a flash, because I loaned her a decent camera. She turned on the flash, and you take that to that. 
And the reason is it's what we call fill flash. You're filling in the shadows with the flash. You're compensating for it. You're still getting that hair light coming from the sun behind her, but we're going from that to that. Same tree. Okay. Here's my son uh, with one of his 150 girlfriends. Um, he's 17. This is the way they are. Flash, no flash. Just to show you the difference. This here is actually not a flash. I cheated and threw this in. How do we get all this light on them? Anybody know? Reflector. reflector. So if you guys, uh, you can buy the pop-up reflectors here. Actually, you can buy everything here. Um, <laughs> this is why we love coming. Uh, but you can get the little pop-up reflectors, little round one, uh, I think Westcott or whatever. And, um, I use the gold side here. I actually have my wife doing it. So my wife is off to my left, and she's taking it, and I'm like, stop right there. And she's throwing the light on them to create a nice golden kind of glow because they were in the shade. So we just threw some lights. It's not flash. It's using a reflector, but it's the same idea of adding light to the photo to get me a little bit more light on them to bring them out. Getting in close. One of the things I talked about, we talked about the fact that people like to shoot uh, from you know the feet to to, to the head, um, I, I love getting in tight. Like I said, just with the ant, you know, I like to, to bring things to life. When we were in Maui last year, this is a gecko. The gecko is about like this big. He was on this leaf, and so I was shooting, and it was uh, at the, actually it was right in the hotel, so it wasn't like I was out you know scouring the wilderness of Maui or, or actually the Big Island. Um, he's happened to be there. So I got down really low so that I could accentuate the shadow of the gecko, but still get his face in there. And that's just taken with a, I don't remember what lens I used, probably the macro lens or something, but um, you know, I, I brought you in close to a gecko that's this big, which is way more interesting than the average Hawaii picture of a gecko. What are they? They're usually, hey, see a little dot on the wall? That's right by our hotel, that's a gecko. This shot here was taken uh, at a safari, believe it or not, they have a thing called Safari West in California. It's in Napa by the wine country, and they've taken all these animals and they have like uh, safari bungalows and you can spend the night, it's kind of cool. So I was teaching a class there, and um, what I was trying to show here is, I did use fill flash to, to light it up a little bit, but I wanted to show the people, you don't have to have the entire animal to make it interesting. So I waited and got this shot in between the horns of another animal, to capture it. This is my dog Bailey. Um, my other dog, he passed away a couple years ago. He was a great dog and he loved going in the snow and he loved like burying his head in the snow and that's what all that is. And so um, I got him nice and close to him, got that shot. And again, there the snow is more in focus than the eyes are. And that was done on purpose. This next shot um, is interesting because my daughter plays field hockey and she told me, Dad, when you go to the Olympics, if you don't shoot field hockey, don't come home. Um, so I did, I went and shot it, and it was great because it was literally the venue right next to the press center. So every time I had free time, I'd run over there and try to get her some shots. So I shot a bunch of action there, and frankly, it was cool because the field was a really unique color. It wasn't green, it was the Olympic colors. Um, and this particular shot doesn't show the action. But the shot works for me because of a lot of things. One is I had shot a shot about 30 minutes prior to this where there had been a penalty, and they put the ball there, and I thought, that's kind of cool, just the ball there. This time, the guy put the ball, and the logo was facing me perfectly. I'm like, thank you. And then came over and put his foot there with the hockey stick also in the frame. And again, it tells a story. It's colorful. It's interesting. It's different. Um, and that's what I'm striving for. And it's interesting. Uh, if you guys look at, do you, anybody here knows Scott Kelby? He's like the Photoshop god, right? So uh, the guest blog today for Scott Kelby is a blog I wrote for him. They just went live this morning, and it's all about what it's like to shoot the Olympics and all the challenges in the Olympics. The biggest challenge is you're with 2,200 other photographers. So how do you get a unique shot? So I'm always trying to strive to find something different so that I find something different than the person next to me. And the woman next to me from the LA Times or wherever she's from looked at that shot and thought, that's because I showed it to her because we tend to chimp and show each other stuff. And uh, she goes, that's a cool shot. I wish I'd gotten that. I'm like, cool. You guys know what chimping is, right? Every no? Yeah. No? Chimping is when you, when you shoot and you look at your camera and you go, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> and um, 
there's a lot of talk about chimping uh, on the internet. People are like, people shouldn't chimp so much. Because it is true that sometimes when you're looking down, you're missing what's happening. And I have, there's a photo I saw recently. I think it was the Super Bowl. I could be wrong. And they have all these photographers. And something amazing happened. And this one photographer is chimping like this. And I thought, oh, wow, he missed that one. Um, but we all do it. It's, it you know, I mean, I tend to look at my frames, too, as I'm going. My daughter will text me, Daddy, you're on TV again at the Olympics, and you're chimping. Like, you know, like, I'll tell you, yeah, I know. Um, they like to rib me. Getting in close. Probably my favorite shot from uh, London. Um, and this was kind of lucky. I wish I could tell you I was smart enough to actually shoot this frame as is. I actually cropped in on it to get this shot. But I noticed that the particular athlete had the Olympic rings tattooed, which kind of matched really well with the rings of the ball. So I guess that's one of my favorite photos. And um, uh, because it's different. And it is getting close. All right, having fun and breaking the rules. And like I said, um, one of the great things about photography is that we can break the rules. Um, because I'm telling you, get in close, it doesn't mean you have to. I'm telling you, keep your horizon straight, maybe you don't want to. And that's OK, because it's your photography. Um, this one here, horizon is not straight. But I didn't want it to be straight there. I wanted to create a little bit more um, energy by turning the camera, panning with him, and showing motion of the road. But uh, you know, he's not really going into space. Although God knows the speed they're going, they could. Um, but it creates a different feel to the image. Trying something different. This is just weird, but this is me being weird. <laughs> I decided to do a self-portrait. I love Diet Coke. It's my one like vice, or one of my vices. Um, and so I took a 5D Mark II, put it in timer mode, pre-focused to about two feet, <laughs> threw it in the back of my fridge, and shot that. Why? Just because. Um, this shot, this is uh, my son and my two nephews. Um, and I shot this, again, just for fun, breaking the rules. Uh, computer was not even on. On this shot, what I did was, you can see a piece of tape. There's a little piece of tape on top of the computer there. I taped a piece of white paper to the screen. I took a wireless flash with a pocket wizard, I think, at the time. And I put it, and I gelled it with red and blue plastic in front of the flash, so it created the color. And it bounced that off the white piece of paper and back at their heads. And that's what I shot. Why? Just because we're having fun. I, <clears throat> the flash is actually on the keyboard <clears throat> facing the screen, or what would be the screen, which is now a piece of white paper. And it's just bouncing off of the red and blue off of that. And then the kids were like this. I'm like, no, 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 pretend like there's something interesting there. There's a girl, ooh, and the, you know, teenage boys. Uh, being different, this is a shot, Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco, uh, shot at night. Again, blue sky, so it's just after sunset. Uh, same shot while rolling the zoom, trying something different. So all this is is, is on the tripod, probably about a six second exposure, give or take. And while it, I, I hit the button, and now it's releasing, and as it's doing, I'm rolling the zoom so the lights then get drawn out. Try it. And you know what? If you try it and the first 20 don't come out, don't be surprised. Try it again. And try zooming out. Try zooming in. Try different speeds. Try leaving it for three seconds and then rolling. Try different things. It's really fun. Here's, uh, again, Paris. Uh, I shot this frame uh, because the carriage had stopped Dead center, actually it, didn't, actually it did stop, I think, right there. And if it hadn't, I would have waited for it to walk right by that point and then shoot it. But that's a fairly typical kind of touristy shot, right? So what I did was I wanted something a little different. I'm walking away from the Eiffel Tower, and I see this cracked glass. And I focused on that. It's not a reflection. That's actually looking through a, uh, it's, it's th it's a super thick piece of glass that had cracked. And I don't know if it's supposed to be cracked as art or what it was. But it worked for me. Is anybody going to look at this and go, where'd you take it? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's the Eiffel Tower. You can pretty much tell it's the Eiffel Tower. But it's different. What's that? What was the aperture? That was probably, I think I shot this at 5.6. And the reason, again, is I want to show enough of the Eiffel Tower not to blur it out completely. But I wanted the focal point. And I have this picture multiple ways. I have this picture where the Eiffel Tower is in focus with this kind of uh, out of focus kind of lines going all over the place, which didn't work as well. And then I did it as well with this in focus, with that out of focus, and try it different ways to see what worked. 
But again, what I like about it is, I don't know about you, but I have never seen this image before you know, on the internet. So I'm always trying to do something different. And it isn't because I'm trying to, you know, it's not for any magazine. It's just for me. How many people here have gotten a money shot? Like that one shot where like, oh my God, that's it. Anybody? Okay, like four or five people. Wait till you do. Once you guys get it, it'll blow you. Then you'll understand why we're so possessed like this. Because when you get that one shot, when you follow some of these rules and you get it, you're like, oh my God, like I, I took this. Or it's a key moment, and I've told this story here before, where I photographed my mom. We went on a cruise two months before she passed away. It was a botched surgery. It wasn't supposed to happen. But we had gone on this cruise right before, and I got this one picture of my mom that is probably one of the best pictures I ever took of her. She didn't like having her picture taken, but she even liked this one photo. And now, whenever I think of my mom, I think of that, that last photo I took. I don't think about her in the hospital passing away, which is horrible. I think about that picture where she looked vibrant, full of energy, great colors, you know, fit. there was the dress up night on the cruise ship. And uh, those are why we take photos, right? Because that, that's not a picture to me. That's not even a photo to me. That is more than anything. I can't even describe what that is to me, but it's important. And this is why we do photography, right? So when we talk about these rules, these are to help you get a better picture, but taking the pictures of the people that you love and the things that you love doing is really a big piece of that. So just to reiterate uh, where you can find me, um, if you didn't get this before, I'm kind of everywhere. I, um, I will answer emails. Uh, and uh, when you email me, it might take me a day or two to get back to you, but I do answer emails. So if you guys have questions, um, you can send them to me. And I will answer you, I promise. Um, and now, what questions do you guys have since we held so many of them? Yeah. Many of your pictures have very vibrant colors. Is that post? So, yeah, the question is, a lot of the pictures have vibrant colors. Is that in post in production? Uh, generally not. Um, you mo a vibrant mode then? No, I don't use any vibrant modes or anything. Uh, I just take places in color. I take pictures in colorful places. Um, honestly, there are times when I do pump the saturation, but it's not very often for a lot of reasons. One, it looks fake. Um, like there's nothing worse to me than going to a uh, art show and you see a photographer and he's got the landscape with all the pretty flowers in Colorado and they're like, you know, 75% oversaturated. Um, it sells postcards for sure. I don't like doing it. Um, sometimes I'll tweak it by plus three, plus five, but usually not. Um, but uh, the one trick for shooting outdoor photos to get bluer skies like, uh, is to uh, you stop down by a third stop minus on your camera. If you control your exposure compensation, you go down just a teeny bit, and it tends to over vibrant colors. Polarizer. polarizer filter can work as well at, if you're in the right environment. Um, there are times, like the one picture that you saw of Brooklyn Bridge in New York, I did uh, pull the contrast on that to make this, the clouds stand out more. So there, there are times when I'll do that. Not, as, not all that often. There was a question, I know, uh, actually, I, I promised you first, and then we'll get to yours. Yeah? If you're shooting an indoor model, how would you feel more If I'm shooting indoor models, what? If you're shooting, like, indoor models, what mode would you shoot? What mode would I shoot indoor models? Probably aperture priority. I would be, so when I'm shooting, even though I'm in aperture priority, I'm watching my shutter speed constantly. So I'm shooting a model. Uh, let's assume I'm not using a flash, because in a flash you want to stay at 200 of a second or less, otherwise it blows out on most cameras. So uh, if I'm not using a flash, I'm just going to be using whatever, you know, or maybe I'm balancing a flash, so I don't really care as much. Aperture priority, um, depending on how much I want to show the background. Let's say I don't want to show the background, I might be at f2.8. And then I'm going to have my ISO, if I'm indoors, I'll probably start around 800 and see how it looks. What's my shutter speed? You, there's a rule, which is your shutter speed should be at least what your focal length is. So let me explain that. If I am shooting with a lens that is a 50 millimeter lens, I want a shutter speed. If I want to be in focus, unless you're really steady, you want your shutter speed to be 50th of a second. If I'm shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, I want to be at 200th of a second. It's kind of a general rule of thumb. So when I'm shooting this model, I'll be at, Let's say uh, I want to be at f4. 
and my ISO is 800, and I'm looking at the shutter speed as I'm shooting, and it says 20th of a second. Wow, it's dark in here. And I'm shooting at 150 millimeters. Can I hold that at 20th of a second? Probably not. Actually, I might be able to, but I, I'm not going to risk it. That's really slow. So I'll push the ISO to 1600. What do I know? Oh, I'm at 40th of a second. That's better. All right, so I'll go even higher, whatever. So I'm making adjustments. So I'm letting the camera figure it out for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm working with the camera and making modifications as I go. And the other thing is, it depends on the skin complexion. If you're dark skinned and you're in a dark environment, I've got to open up a little bit more than if you're fair skin wearing a white shirt, it's going to be a little different. And experiment. And this is where, again, if you have, you know, take a lot of photos and experiment with it and try it at different ISOs. If I'm at ISO 6400 taking that photo, it's going to be grainier. But if it's in focus, I can degrain it later. And I'm going to show that in the next session, how to take that grain back out. And then it's still a savable image. Better than having something blurry and out of focus that you can't use. You had a photo or a question. With a what? Can it be accomplished with what? With a basic 18 by 5 Good question. So the question is, that with, the, with the depth of field I'm showing here, with a lot of blur in the background stuff, can that be done with an 18 to 55 kit lens? Yeah. The answer is, if you're shooting at 18, because <laughs> remember, as you're zooming even that lens, you're losing your aperture, your, your, your light. So with that lens, if you're shooting at f3.5, way to get separation is between what is the distance between you and your subject and your subject in the background? So if I'm photographing him, stand up for a second. Thank you. Please. Thanks. So if I'm taking a picture of him and, uh, he, and, I, and he's right by the computer, and, and so the distance between us is about 18 inches, and the distance between him and the background is 18 inches, there's not going to be much separation with any lens, unless I'm using like an f1.4 or 1.2. Now, if I turn him, and now I'm shooting, and the distance between him and I is 18 inches, but the background is now 30 feet. Bye bye to the background. Okay? So the distance between you and your subject and your subject and your background will help determine that. Now, at the Olympics, I can't say to someone like Michael Phelps, hey, come closer to me. You're right? It doesn't. So I have to get into a position and shoot wide open with a, the lowest number possible, with highest aperture. So f2.8 or f2 or whatever I can get and shoot that. Yeah, you, thank you. So, yeah. so really, the distance between us determines that. So again, going back to our cantaloupe example, take, get close to your cantaloupe, shoot, move your cantaloupe to different areas, you know, whatever. It could be a banana, you know, it could be a person. If you have a kid laying around that you own, use them. <laughs> um, make them do something for you for a change. Um, but you know, and, and like, seriously, with my daughter, I wanted to practice motion panning. <clears throat> which is when you slow your shutter speed and you, and you pan. By the way, you're in the perfect city for it. Just go to Times Square or Central Park and follow cabs. Well, I'm in an area where we don't have a lot of taxi cab stuff. So I had my daughter on her bike, and I just had her go up and down the block 20 times as I experimented with shutter speeds and practicing, because it's an art on how to pan and do that. So um, experiment with it and try it. But what you'll find, honestly, is that when you want to get more separation, you'll end up getting a different lens. You'll end up getting something. It depends on what you're shooting. So people ask me all the time, what's the lens I recommend? Depends what you're shooting. So let me tell you, I have a lens. The lenses I brought with me on this trip, I brought a 70 to 200 because I'm shooting uh, two models while I'm out here. So I need that lens. It's a good, great lens. That's my money lens. It's expensive, but it's killer. Um, I also brought a 24 to 105 because it's a great all around walk around the town type of lens. What was that one? 24 to 105. It's f4, would not be good for taking portraits here in this room, but it's a good all around walk around lens. The other lens I brought with me is a 50 millimeter 1.4. It's tiny, I can show it to you, it's here. It's a 51.4, little guy. And the reason I bring it is because it's 1.4. I could take a portrait of him right now in this room with that lens with no flash if I wanted. So if I'm in Grand Central Station and want a photo and can't use a flash or don't want to use a flash, I could use that lens and do it. So those are kind of the three I bring with me. So if you want to experiment and get great depth of field, that 50 millimeter 
or if you want to go really inexpensive, the 50 millimeter 1.8 lens, they're very reasonably priced. And I'll tell you what, that'll, that'll freak you out the first time you use it because your depth of field is going to be so much greater than what you've ever seen in the kit lens. But email me if you, if you want some more details or if you want to tell me what you're trying to shoot, I, I'll try to help you out through that too. Good question. Okay, so she has a Rebel T3i, entry level DSLR, great camera. And let me tell you something, better to take a camera like that and put a good lens on it than buy a really great camera with a kit lens. Mm -hmm. Lenses make all the difference. So great camera, do everything, all, every shot I've taken here almost, you could do with a T3i. The Olympics might be a bit of a challenge because you need the speed. But mm -hmm. so the different shooting modes, you have JPEG and you have RAW and you have different levels of JPEG and RAW. First of all, never shoot at anything less than the highest level JPEG. Why? Because memory cards are dirt cheap. I mean, I, I work for Lexar, it's a commodity. I mean, you could buy them here for like ridiculous amount of money. So they've gotten so cheap, you don't care about the capacities anymore. So shoot the fine JPEGs, okay? I shoot everything raw. Shooting raw, though, means that you have to understand processing. If you are, are you coming to the class at, at uh, four? Yeah. I'm gonna show the 15 features that'll get you there from raw <clears throat> to get them done. But um, the raw is the best. Raw, there's more data than there is JPEG. If I sh shoot anything that I care about, which is really almost everything I shoot, it's shot raw. Now, I'm trying to think if I shot anything in JPEG anymore. I don't think I do. Even the Olympics, I'm one of the few shooters that shoots everything raw. Um, because there's more data and more to play with and more manipulation ability in a raw file. But you have to understand how to tweak a raw. So they're going to videotape what I'm doing this afternoon. If, you, if you're not going to be here, watch that, because that'll help you get there. But um, here's the challenge with shooting. JPEG is, a, is the easy way to start, OK? And it'll get you there most of the way. The advantage of RAW is once you shoot RAW, once you get good enough at shooting, you'll kick yourself at the stuff you shot JPEG. If you were to go to, you know, you go to Venezuela for vacation, and you shoot everything JPEG, and then you get good, and you're like, ah, oh, I wish I'd shot them RAW, that'll happen. So, yeah, I'll get you. You shoot in raw and you shoot a lot. Is that a storage problem? Mm. I do shoot a lot and I do shoot raw. Is that a storage problem for me? No, I have uh, 40 terabytes at my house now. I'm not using all of it yet. Um, so I use what's called the Drobo, which is a RAID system. I've got four, uh, five four terabyte Western Digital Enterprise class drives in that one. I have another Drobo with 10 terabytes. I have two more four terabyte drives, which I crisscross to my home and my office in case I have a fire. And that has backups of all my images. So here's the other thing. Hard drives have gotten pretty cheap too. So again, going back to the fact that I'm shooting images and I care about them and want to keep them, I have every digital image I've ever photographed that I've kept. So when I shoot something, the Olympics, I shot 87,000 images in three weeks. Of those 87,000, I kept about 48,000. Because there's a lot where like, the guy has the ball and he's like this. And he doesn't shoot. And I'm like, come on. And I'm like, brr, 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 brr. I'm like, uh. So I mean, I'll delete some of those. Or they're out of focus or, or just no good subject matter or whatever. Uh, or sometimes your referee will walk in the way or whatever. You get rid of all of those. But those 48,000, I have every image from Beijing, Vancouver, London, and I'm heading to Russia next year. This time I'll be there. I'll keep them all. What am I going to do with them? I, I don't know. But I want them. And hard drives are cheap, so. Um, in JPEG and RAW, would you see the picture different when you print it? Uh, so there's more data in RAW, I mean, unless you have a really good printer, maybe, maybe not. It depends, honestly, how much you're processing. There's some people, um, there's a guy here in New York named Douglas Dubler, who is the, like the master of printing. And that guy, yeah, you'd see a difference. For your average photo that, that would be taken by the average consumer, probably not. What it lets you do is manipulate it. Like, I never print a RAW image. I, photo, I touch every photo in Photoshop. Maybe not much but a little bit. If there's dust on a suit, this is what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Little stuff, contrast, color, um, exposure levels, whatever it might be, there might be a little tweak. Nothing major. It's like, it's like seasoning, a little bit, great. Some need major, well, hopefully not. 
raw, allow, raw gives you that much more data to manipulate to then finish your image to print. What am I printing? I'm printing a JPEG at the end. And it, but, I'm, but I'm working with the data to get to the point where my, my photo's done. And then my second part of that question, as far as printing is concerned, I mean, what, what do you recommend to, like, if you want to just uh, develop a photo album? Um, well, for albums, what I love is, I, I mean, I, we use uh, like Bay Photo or, or you can use Shutterfly or the Apple books. Those books are amazing for the money. I, I'm impressed by what they can do. When I do an album, you know, we do albums for our customers and, and we do some high end stuff and they're beautiful. If you just want to print a four by six or five by seven, honestly, I have an Epson consumer grade uh, printer that does the scanning, faxing, and that thing prints a really good four by six or five by seven, like the Artisan 835, or I don't know what it is now, it's probably the Artisan 850 or whatever, but they're like a couple hundred bucks. The only problem with it is it drinks ink like a drunken sailor. So I do use the Epson R2000, the bigger Epson printer that was about 500 bucks. And that thing does not go through ink nearly as fast and the quality is great. And I use it all the time. And actually, uh, I've done other seminars here where I've talked about printing, uh, shooting events and, and I keep laughing because that thing is printing money for me. Because I charge like 20 bucks for a five by seven that I can print on that thing for almost nothing, you know, 50 cents. So I used to job out and do all my stuff through a color lab. If I get an order for six four by sixes or five by sevens, I'll just print it right there. Whoop, 150 bucks. Mail it out. I'm just paid for all my ink for the year. I mean, it's great. And it's a great printer. And it's not, you know, it's like 500 bucks. Epson uh, R2000. And it does pretty much everything I need. I've never printed on a Canon printer. It's funny because I use all Canon cameras, but I've only used Epson for printing. And I've had such good luck with it that I don't see any reason to switch. So, yeah. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, is there any thumb rule for uh, auto white balance or white balance? Another good question. Uh, white balance, is there a good rule for it? Honestly, 90% of the time I shoot an auto white balance. Maybe 99%. And here's why, I shoot raw. In RAW, it's really easy to adjust it later. It is. So I just go, I shoot the whole thing. And I, you know, why do I do it? Because I'm, I am a keep it simple kind of person. So I don't want to sit there and go, oh god, what's my shutter speed? What's my aperture? What's my ISO? What's my white balance? What's my, what's my, like, no, no, no. I, I, what I really want is to be looking in front of me going, oh, there's, oh my god, it's a great picture, mom, and whatever, boom, boom, boom. So I generally will leave it in all white balance. And there are times when I shoot an event, like, I, like this one I did on Saturday, um, one of the temples I shot in, I actually shot two on Saturday, and one of the temples I shot in has this really yellowy, nasty wood. I mean, it's beautiful, but it looks like heck when you get the pictures. So white balance is off by oh, probably over a thousand Kelvin. Ask me if I care. Because I know when I go to process the images, oh wait, these are all shot around 4,700 Kelvin, they should be at 3,800 Kelvin. So I, when I go to edit the photo, I just change that. Uh, 3,800, okay, and then I edit the photo. 3,800, I edit the photo. So um, it, it is a little bit, it is one more step. But you know what, I'm gonna adjust it anyway. Even if I use like an Expo disc, which I've done for ice hockey, where I'll white balance off of it, and then shoot, I still end up going, ah, it's a little too cool. And I'll warm it up. So it's like, it's, I do it by taste. One thing I uh, talk about coming up at uh, four, I think it is, is um, I do, um, Use, what was I just gonna say, hold on here. Now I've lost my thought, damn. Um, I'll come back to it. I'll think of what it was, let me think here. White balance, darn it. Oh well, I'll think of it, it'll come back. What is white balance? Um, white balance is the color of light. So um, anybody here bought any of the new LED lights, light bulbs for your house? They're really blue, a lot of them, especially the first ones, were really blue. So you're used to the yellow lights, incandescent lights in your house, and you put those in, you're like, bleh, because they're really blue, which means that they're a lower number on the Kelvin scale. You guys have Costco here. I found the greatest LED lights. I put this on my blog last week. Some of my favorite new technology. You guys ever heard of Fitbit? It sits in your pocket, and it Bluetooth to your phone, tells you how much you're walking. Oh, yeah. Coolest thing ever. Yeah. Um, 
I digress. Um, <laughs> but uh, I also found that uh, um, Costco has these great LED lights, and they're, I think they're at 3,800 Kelvin or something. They're just like your incandescent lights. They last for 23 years yeah. per light bulb. They're like 15 bucks each. But they also use 15 watts versus like 150 watts. So like my energy, my kids don't know what a light switch, they don't know that a light switch can go down, just up. So I've been, I've been, I spent like 400 bucks last week on lights. Cause I'm tired of telling the kids, turn off the lights. No, like, oh, whatever. Cause they use like one tenth the power, it's so cool. But white balance is that color of light. And so when you're shooting, if you're shooting an image, oh, what the heck, I'll show you. Give me a sec. <coughs> Uh, let me see if I can uh, pull up. Uh, let me see if I can find one here. Because this is, uh, oh, those are edited. Okay. So, like this one here. That's very yellow. Okay. If I were to edit that photo, which we're going to do in the next class. If I pull that white balance, so I'm at 4450 here. This is as of a shot. Ready? Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. So here's a really nasty yellowy thing, and here's two blue. So I can pull it to about right there, which is about right where I was, 4750. So if I go here, it's like, yeah. So the camera might shoot auto white balance here. All I do is go, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, two blue. Back maybe right there. Good. That's white balance. And it's that easy. So, so that's why I leave an auto white balance. Do it later. Yeah, the four o'clock class. So. It's the fit. The next class is the 15 features I use 90% of the time. Like Photoshop's got thousands of features. I find that 90% of the time I use 15 or less to, to finish my photos. So I thought about when we were talking about doing another class this afternoon, six months ago, and they said, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, Let's. I was thinking about ideas, and I thought, well, I'll do that because it's something that. Will help people out. So, if you're taking a, a picture where you can't you can't move and it's in mixed lighting, would you handle it the same way that this was handled? Or, or um, yeah, handle sure. If I well, like but mixed lighting, you can adjust lighting uh, later in post. Like for instance, well, and we'll show that coming up. For you can I can I can lighten darken. I can selectively darken this. I mean, you could do. There's nothing you can do in, in camera. Huh? No, in camera. Well, yes, you can. You can adjust exposure in camera as well. Thank you for coming, you guys. By the way. For more information, please visit us online. Give us a call or stop by our New York City superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.